Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Images in Focus show. I'm David Swindler, and with me is my good friend, Juan Pons. Juan, how's it going today? I'm doing great, and I hope you're doing good as well. And I'm really looking forward to another episode of the Images in Focus show. Me too. And in some previous videos, we discussed a lot of topics related to understanding autofocus. And we invite you to view those videos if you haven't yet seen them. And we talk about topics such as the mechanics of autofocus. Like exactly how does it work within your camera? Understanding that goes a long way to being able to predict what the camera might do in certain circumstances. We talked about phase detection versus contrast detection. The different types of autofocus points, whether they're single points or cross type points. We talked about focus modes, whether you want to use like continuous mode, single shot mode, hybrid mode, etc. We talked about the concept of hyperfocal distance. This is really important, especially if you're into that landscape style of photography. And we, we actually dedicated an, an entire video to the technique of back button focus because we feel it's such a powerful tool to take control of the focus system within your camera. But today, we're going to get even more into the nitty gritty. And we are going to talk about advanced autofocus settings and techniques. So let's delve into it. I want to first of all touch on focus zones. Now these vary qu quite a bit by camera manufacturer. You know, we're not going to get into, okay, Sony has this, Canon has this, Nikon has that. We're just kind of give you an overview of what can be available. And it's up to you to consult your camera manual to see what you can actually do with your particular camera model. But most cameras are going to have a wide setting where you basically has all the points active and the camera is going to kind of decide which ones it activates. Uh, you can also set it to specific zones like center, left edge, right edge, top or bottom. You can uh, do you use like medium sized or small sized squares. Uh, you can have a flexible spot where you can kind of move around within the array of autofocus points. You can also select a single autofocus point and some cameras will even allow you to do a pinpoint autofocus where it'll just do the center of that one autofocus point. Now you want to choose carefully. If you choose the wrong mode for whatever type of situation you're shooting, it can be very frustrating and cause lots of out of focus images. And during this presentation, we're gonna kind of give you some guidance on which mode you should choose for certain types of situations. Now, when you're doing tracking, like let's say I'm tracking a moving animal or I'm photographing like someone playing a sport, then yeah, generally speaking, you're gonna to wanna to have a smaller zone to kind of de make sure that I don't lose focus on my subject. Now that's gonna depend. Certain types of situations are going to want to use a little bit larger zone, and we'll talk about when and why that is. And if the camera gets confused or begins to track the wrong subject, that's where you want to disengage the focus and re-engage once more. And that's where things like back button focus can really help, because it allows me to instantly disengage my focus and re-engage when I'm ready for it to lock on again. Now let's uh, talk a little bit visually about these zones. Here is like that zone autofocus I was talking about, where you can set it to like the center, where it'll just pick up on like center points. I can set it to the left edge or the right edge. Let's say I have a subject that's moving in a particular way, and I know it's gonna continue in that particular direction. Or I can do top or bottom. This wide here, that's usually not as useful because the camera's gonna make a lot of decisions for me, and it may not be where I want the focus to be set. And then I can also go in and just choose a single point out of the entire array or even get to pinpoint autofocus. And just as a caveat to hold out there, sometimes a single point autofocus, it can be difficult to achieve precise placement. If I'm trying to handhold a long lens and in the, I'm getting excited, I'm moving around, uh, you have to be very precise with your handholding steadiness in order to make sure that autofocus point lands right where it should. You know, David, I think it's important to mention, too, that all of these camera systems have different names for all these different modes, and we're seeing a proliferation of uh, out-of-focus modes. So you just have to look at your camera, understand the different modes that it provides, and oftentimes these cameras allow you the ability to limit which focus mode you can activate when you're out in the field to make it a little simpler. You don't have to go through 30 different options or variations. You can just choose maybe the two, three, or four options or uh, settings that you like using the most. Absolutely. 
you know, the better you can streamline and customize the camera to your preferences, the better you're going to do in the field. Because the last thing you want to be doing right. is stumbling through a whole host of menu functions uh, when you're ready to take that shot. Yeah, I mean, there is, and we're going to talk about this a little later on, there is a, a thing is too many options or too many choices. It can actually distract you and make you uh, miss those shots. So make sure you don't do that. Exactly. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples here. Um, so the first example that we're going to look at is this bison shot in, in Yellowstone in the winter. And you can see why using that wide mode or all the focus points um, engaged is not a good thing. You could have, you know, some elements in the scene that may confuse your autofocus system. For example, in this scene, we have a branch on the upper right hand side that we're using as a framing element. Um, and it adds a lot of depth and dimension to the image. But if I had my focus setting set to wide, it is possible that the camera may decide those branches are the thing to focus on. And then my bison would be completely out of focus. If we look at the next slide, what you'll find is that you can go in and set in the autofocus to a smaller area. This is a Sony system, so I'm, this is a zone mode. Um, but still, you know, that branch is still in that in that frame. Um, so it is possible that the camera may decide to focus on that. And again, I may miss the shot. If we look at the next slide, you can see that this is a much better uh, uh, focus, um, out of focus mode. This is a center mode where only the center of the frame and the relatively small area of the frame is engaged and out of focus. And that allows me to much more easily select my subject and much more accurately focus on that subject without having anything else in the background competing with the uh, out of focus system. So yeah, do you have a couple a of examples e too, right? Oh, I sure do. So here's an example of where I would set my focus zone to be kind of the bottom part of the frame. And the reason why is I wanted to be able to see these hills here in the background and you kind of see the, the light kind of coming off into the sky. So compositionally, I wanted my oryx uh, to be down in that lower third of the frame. Now they were just walking along and at times they would overlap with each other. A lot of times they'd have their heads down or this or that. I wanted to get a shot where they all have good separation and they have kind of had their heads up so I can really see their horns. So I had to take quite a few shots as they're moving along. Now because they're kind of just walking along in this kind of uh, parallel line to me, you know, I was able to just put it in the bottom zone and just keep tracking them and then firing off shots when the positioning looked good. So this is a case here where you'd use the bottom zone rather than trying to use the center zone. If I were to use the center zone, then I would not get this composition in the hills and everything like that that I would want. Yeah, certainly your subjects would be, you know, a completely out of focus. Yes, exactly. So let's talk about uh, this panned photo. Panning is kind of a difficult technique. I think we'll probably do a video on this in one of our future episodes. But with panning, you have to stay right on that, that subject. You know, you're using some slower shutter speeds and everything like that to kind of blur the background as the animal moves. And in this case, what I would do is definitely use the center zone to try to keep the focus right over the animal's head. And I, what I would do is I would shoot a lot wider out. And I would keep the animal's head right in the center of the frame. That way I'm not going to cut anything off. And then later in my post-processing, I would then crop to get my desired composition. Now, that's why I like these newer cameras that are coming out because they're much higher resolution. It gives me much more margin and ability to crop digitally after the fact. You know, David, that's a crucial technique because um, one of the things that happens for a lot of people is that in um, situations where you have... Uh, fast motion or it's a dynamic situation people like to zoom in and try to crop with their camera and I you know I think and I know you think the same thing it's a mistake to do that you're better off going wide and focus on tracking that subject right and you know same yep. thing with for example this next shot that's coming up um, we have a puffin here uh, flying in the air and the you know, and this applies really to all kinds of birds in flight, which is birds in flight is probably one of the hardest things that we do as wildlife photographers because flights, you know, birds can be erratic in the way that they fly, plus they're flying very fast. And the, you know, we're contending with the direction of the light and the wind and the direction of the wind, all sorts of different 
factors. So what we want to be doing here in most cases is shoot much wider, like like David was saying. We want to be able to focus, you know, I guess to use uh, a pun, really on getting those focus points on our animal as the animal is moving. It's hard enough to do that. Um, and you can make it even harder by zooming in and focusing tight on those subjects. So keep it wide, keep your subjects smaller in the frame, make sure that you're able to keep them in the focus area, um, and then crop in in post-processing. But this is really why it's important to also use a wider area of focus. We don't want to use the entire frame again because of the same reason. You know, for example, if there's a bird that flew behind this one, and we were using the wide area out of focus system, you know, that focus system may decide to pick up on that other bird that flew in the background. Or maybe there's a tree that went in the background as you were panning with that, with that, flying, or that bird in flight. Um, you want to limit the area the autofocus is looking at. The other thing that happens is, you know, when you limit the area that the autofocus system needs to focus on, the autofocus system performs better because it doesn't have to look at the entire frame. It's just looking at a portion of the frame to make its calculations to figure out whether something is in focus or not. So, in for example, in the Sony system that both David and I use for birds and flight, I'm typically using the zone mode, um, which is about, I don't know, maybe uh, a quarter or a fifth of the frame that I can then move around. But, you know, when I shot uh, Canon, what I would have to often do is set up the six focus points and that was wide enough that I was then able to keep my subject and focus within that within that frame so keep that in mind when you're using um, these focus modes and when you're using uh, or when you're trying to photograph fast moving animals exactly and sometimes if you're doing like a bird in flight like this you can use a little bit larger of a focus zone and that'll just help the camera kind of keep centered right over that subject as you're moving along. Um, sometimes with these faster moving subjects, uh, using too small of a zone may make it harder for you to keep uh, keep aligned with the subject as it moves. So, right. you know, there's and different reasons to use. Uh, go ahead, one. Yeah, I was going to say, especially with these puffins, if you've ever seen puffins, these guys fly so incredibly fast. Because even if you look at these guys, if you look at the – the picture here, you know, their bird, their wings are relatively small to the body size, so they have to flap those wings insanely fast. So it's the faster the move, the, the the subject moves, the harder it is to keep them in that frame. It's hard enough to do it even with big animals, smaller animals that move fast. It's almost impossible. So you want to make sure you keep it nice and wide. Yes. And the same thing applies here with this particular image. Um, you know, this is even more challenging for the autofocus system. You can just imagine if you had the, the you know, a much bigger framing box or autofocus box uh, or more sensors where you have all these birds down in the, in, the, in the lower part of the frame. The camera would be really confused and we may be trying to focus on these birds on the bottom than the bird that's in flight. So by me setting the zone uh, focus on the upper part of the frame, I'm able to focus the uh, autofocus system or tell the autofocus system to only pay attention to the top part of the frame. And then it's easier for me to track those subjects and make sure that the, that the camera and focus. You know, this is the only way you could make an image like this because otherwise the autofocus system would be thrown off by all these other subjects in the foreground that are in focus. And there's more of them and oftentimes they're moving so that they may detract the autofocus system. You don't want the autofocus system to have to decide which part of the image is in focus. You need to tell it and tell it which part of the image to focus on. And that's what these autofocus different zones allow us to do. Absolutely. Uh, here's another great example, Juan, from your shot from Yellowstone. Oh, yeah. So this this image, you know, we as, as we were reviewing the presentation, we're going, um, they made a point in that the only... The only way to make an image like this would be to really use a small focus point. If you can see here, there's so much in this image, all these uh, willows in the foreground, that the camera just can't make, imp it's impossible for the camera to make a decision what needs to be in focus. So if we look at the next frame, um, it may be a little bit hard to see, but you'll see that I have a small focus point on the eye on the right as we're looking at the image. And that is the only way, really, 
that you could have had an animal like this in focus. Now, you know, these guys, long tail weasels, um, are incredibly fast moving. And typically, when they're moving across the snow, I would have to have a much bigger focus area. But once it got into these reeds and it was kind of more, you know, subdued and it wasn't running as fast, I was able to very quickly switch over to a small focus point so that I can make sure that my weasel was absolutely in focus and not focusing on one of the other reeds. Now, I do have a, you know, somewhat deep depth of field here um, because it's actually really bright in the snow and in the altitudes of Yellowstone, you actually have quite a bit of light. So I have a nice deep depth of field, but I still want to make sure that my subject is perfectly in focus. Um, and, you know, even if I had used a, 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 uh, a, a medium size mode for the autofocus system, you know, most likely it would have picked up on that branch that's just directly behind the, the head of the weasel. So want to make sure that you use the right autofocus. And in this case, the only way to make this image uh, and have it, you know, exactly in focus is to use a small or the smallest type of autofocus uh, option that you have on your camera. Exactly. And that was the same kind of difficulty I was facing with this moose calf in the dwarf birch. When I first started shooting, you know, I had a little bit wider zone set and the autofocus system kept getting confused and kept focusing on these little branches here in front of the moose. And of course, if you focus a little bit in front or a little bit behind your subject, there's no way your subject's going to be sharp when you have such limited depth of field. In this case, I didn't have a lot of light to work with. I'm wide open as I can on this lens. I'm clear out probably like 400, 500 millimeters. And so if I'm not nailing that focus right on the subject, then the shot's just not going to work. And so I had to very quickly change to a single point or pinpoint autofocus. I actually took this shot with a Canon camera, so I did use that pinpoint autofocus mode. And then I was able to place the autofocus point right over the animal's eye and then waited till the animal stopped eating, raised its head up, and then I took my series of shots. You know, one of the challenges here um, is that, uh, you know, we need to be able to do this very quickly, right? To be able yes. to switch modes very quickly. And this is one of the things I mentioned earlier. You want to try to make sure that you are able to do that by limiting the choices that you have when you're out in the field. So it's something to to keep in mind. Exactly. Okay, so, so if we look at this image here, um, and this is interesting in that, you know, I have two subjects, they're pretty close to each other, but still I'm kind of, you know, at a distance, so my, my depth of field is so much shallow, but I want to make sure my front subject is in focus, and I don't want the camera to be distracted by the subject in the background. Um, so again, I have a smaller, I don't have necessarily the pinpoint, a small one uh, autofocus sensor setting, I have a, a bigger setting, maybe a small setting or a medium setting, and I have it on the head, because as these animals are moving, you know, I want to make, give myself a little bit more room for error for me to move the lens, especially since I'm shooting handheld in this situation. And we don't want that focus to be on our background subject. One thing to keep in mind is that when you have two subjects like this, you know, most of the time you want to have focus on your foreground subject. Having the focus on the background subject doesn't you know, it's not as, doesn't make as good an image. It doesn't feel as comfortable as having your foreground subject in focus. That's not always the case. You know, as all the rules in photography, there are times to break them and times to follow them. But in most cases, you want to have that focus on that front animal. So is, that's exactly right, Juan. And if you use too large of a zone, especially with these cameras that have like that AI technology built into them, uh, the, those AI systems are designed to kind of detect motion. And right. so if this back puffin were to like raise its wings like this, it could suddenly have the focus jump from the foreground puffin to the background puffin, which is not what you would want. So you kind of have to understand what the camera is thinking and you have to be smarter than it and make sure that you set your focus zone appropriately. Right. I mean, you can't substitute your thinking for the camera. You, your camera doesn't think. It just does what it's programmed to do. So you have to learn how the camera operates and kind of predict and make sure that you take advantage of it, just like we've talked about before. Understanding the limitations of your equipment and, it, and its strengths is going to help you make better images. As we discussed earlier, you want to use the center zone for fast action. You want to keep your subject centered in the frame and don't crop in too tightly. And you want to crop later 
for your desired and ultimate composition for the image. What this does is allows you to make sure to encompass your entire subject. As these subjects are moving and they're fast and they could be birch in flight, but oftentimes, you know, like this horse, um, you know, they can be very fast on the ground. And as you're trying to pan and keep up with the subject, it's really hard to make sure that your focus points are on the right part of your subject as, a way, as well as keeping an eye on whatever else may be in the frame. You know, you want to make sure you don't cut those those hooves off, those 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 bottom legs of the of the animal off. Even if you can't see them in this particular scene, um, you want to have enough room for those uh, uh, for those extremities to kind of terminate in in your mind, in your imagination. If we were to crop a little higher up, it would look like the image wasn't, it would be a little uncomfortable because it would look like you you cropped off the extremities of, of, of this animal. So you want to make sure that you have enough in the frame. And this is why it's super important to make sure that you're shooting a little wider. And putting your focus in the center of the frame helps in that regard because you have much more room to see where your subject is leading, where they're going, and where they may have left, and allows you a little more room and a little more breathing room to create the right composition. And I will tell you, the biggest mistake I seem to make when I photograph wildlife is zooming in too tight. Yes, yes, <laughs> I and agree I with home, you. I'm like, man, I cut this little part off, or I didn't leave enough space here or there around my subject, and it can really make the difference between a great shot and a shot that you just want to yeah. throw in the trash. You know, and I think, you know, I, 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 because I do this exact same thing, and I think it's because, you know, we were shooting oftentimes with cameras with, you know, lower resolutions, right? And we wanted to have as much of that resolution as possible. But nowadays, and this is what I keep telling myself when I'm out in the field, is you got, you're shooting with high resolution, I'm shooting with 60 megapixels, I can afford to crop quite a bit and still make a great image. So, you know, it, it's something that you have to work and something that we have to work constantly. Yes, exactly. So one of the modes that I like to use on like these newer cameras, especially with my Sony, is this flexi zone with tracking. And what this allows me to do is to set a tracking box, whether it be a small box, a medium sized box or a more, more large box. So let's say I was shooting a bird in flight. Well, I'd probably use like a larger sized box if I'm shooting an animal where I'm going to have a lot of distracting branches and other things behind it or in front of it, then I would want to use a much, much smaller box. And what I can do is with my back button focus, I can move the camera to where I have that box right over my subject. I then press the back button, it will lock on to that subject. Now as I move the camera, the box stays centered right over the subject, no matter as the camera moves or as the subject moves. And as long as I'm keeping that back button held down, it will continue to track that subject with the autofocus system. And then I can shoot my shutter button whenever I have good photo opportunities. As soon as I let go of that back button, now it loses the tracking. Then I would have to re-engage again on that subject. So like if something were to happen, let's say um, a big animal moved in front of my subject, well, now I've lost the, the focus. So then I would let go of my back button focus. I'd wait for things to uh, normalize. Then I'd lock on my subject again and start shooting. So, you know, these automated modes and these AI systems that the cameras have can be put to, used to great effect. And I would encourage you to play around with what your camera has. Don't do it when you're out, out in the field on an important shoot. Do it at home where you have time to practice. Go to the park, find some birds or something else that will give you a uh, practice with how your camera responds in these types of situations. That, that that's definitely a great uh, uh, great advice you know and we've said this before in a number of other episodes don't wait until you're on those once in a lifetime trips to try out some of these critical functions of your camera or these new features do that when you're at home um, or do it in some downtime when you're out in these locations just incredibly important in order to maximize your time when you're out in the field absolutely so here's an example from the workshop Juan and I ran in Yellowstone this last winter. We had this bull moose out in this field of willows. And it was a little bit dark, and the moose was also quite dark. You know, we didn't have any sunlight shining on the subject. And whenever you have a dark subject, it's very hard for the autofocus system to focus on it. 
because there's not a lot of detail or contrast on that dark subject for it to latch onto. Instead, it's more likely to try to jump to things in the background, such as these willows against the snow. And so I fired off a bunch of shots as this bull moose walked through the field, and only after did I zoom in and realize that the autofocus system got it wrong. Now, I was using the smallest box that Sony had available, but even still, that small box uh, was able to jump beyond the moose's head and pick up on this higher contrast willows behind the moose. So if you zoom in here, you can see the moose is soft and these willows are nice and sharp. Unfortunately, I can't use that shot. And so you have to understand that, you know, if the autofocus system is likely to do this, then I'm going to have to make sure I keep this box positioned over an area where it's fully contained within the moose. And it doesn't have that opportunity to jump in and focus on the background. You know, David, one thing that this, this uh, image really um, drives a point home is that even at a distance like this, you think you have enough depth of field, right? Mm -hmm. But you really don't. You know, if you, you want that critical focus on that moose, you need to make sure that the box is on the moose. Yes, you probably could have gotten a decent enough sharpness on the eye if you had the box over the shoulder, right? Because the distance between the shoulder and the eye, you know, would be inches. Here the, in this image, the distance between that moose and those willows in the background is probably a few feet. You know, it could be five feet or something like that. And even at that distance with a long telephoto lens and wide open aperture, you know, your, your depth of field is still pretty shallow. It is. And the higher the resolution you shoot, the more critical it is that you now <laughs> focus right where you want it. Right. And, now, you know, these animals, like the, sorry, like the moose, right? It's the dark animal, and we had a really overcast skies. So you'd think that that eye would provide enough contrast, but it really doesn't, especially compared to that to that willow in the background. Sorry, I, sorry to interrupt you there. Yeah, and I was just going to say, you know, if I was shooting, like, the old, like, 18 megapixel cameras that we used to have, then, right. you know, it probably wouldn't matter so much. But when you're yeah. shooting 45 megapixel, oh, heck, yeah, it's going to matter. Yeah. So you better nail that focus, uh, especially when you're shooting wide open aperture and long focal lengths. Agreed. And so let's talk about the next technique. It's uh, autofocus micro adjustments. So autofocus micro adjustments. What this is, is that you may encounter sometimes where your camera is not focusing or the focus is not tack sharp, especially when you're using the autofocus system in your camera. And um, what you may also notice is that if you were to focus manually, the image will be tack sharp. But even in those situations where you knew you put that autofocus point on the right part of your subject and the camera wasn't focused, then you look at the resulting image is slightly out of focus, it is time for an autofocus micro adjustment. And what this allows you to do is reset the focus on that particular lens camera combination. This applies to a specific lens on that camera so that you know other lenses are not affected by these adjustments. And for zoom lenses, you can also do that adjustment when you're zoomed in or zoomed out. Um, and, you know, we've noticed that, and, and David and I talked about this earlier, that this seems to be a, a bigger issue with DSLRs than it seems to be with mirrorless cameras. I had some lenses uh, that I would have to micro-adjust every so often because it would fall out of, out of focus or whatnot, where I really haven't had any issues at all in the, in the mirrorless systems that I've been using for over the past four years. Um, you know, and the technique to do this kind of varies between camera systems, so we're not going to go deep into that. But, you know, the technique is actually pretty simple. And if you look at your camera manual, there'll be instructions there how to do that. And it really is all about setting the camera up on a tripod, shooting a subject, looking at the results, making adjustments, shooting again, and adjusting within your camera system. Yes, there are tools out there that allow you to do this, that you can pay a lot of money for, um, you know, and they may make the process a little easier, but you know, you don't need any of those things. You can do those manually. If those help you, by all means, go ahead and do that. But you can do this on your own. I typically use a ruler in order to set the micro adjustments, but you could even use a book or a magazine, anything, or you could even shoot a wall 
So it's really easy to do. So not something you need to be afraid of and you need to feel like you need to send your camera away. But it is critical to make sure that you get your shots tightly in focus. Exactly. And I've had many people actually struggle with this where they'll buy a new lens. It's maybe like mm -hmm. a very fast lens with a super wide aperture. And they're like, I take these shots and they're just not sharp. Yeah. And then if we put the camera on the tripod and we manually focus it and take a picture, if that's nice and sharp, then you know you have a micro adjustment issue. Yeah, it's not a lens issue to, in a way, it's not a lens right? Issue. It's just how the lens and the camera mate together. And then basically we're just apply, applying an adjustment to allow that to sync better with the right. autofocus system. And so another really cool feature on these cameras is eye tracking. And I'll let Juan speak a little bit more about this. <clears throat> so, okay, eye tracking, this is actually a fairly new um, development with these cameras. And what the eye tracking allows the camera to do is see a particular or notice an eye in the scene and focus on that eye regarding, you know, wherever else may be in the scene. And one of the cool things is that for us nature wildlife photographers is that, you know, Sony, when they came out with the system, it wasn't just for human eyes. They also came out with animal eye tracking. And it's remarkable how well it works, especially with the different kinds of eyes that you encounter in the animal kingdom. Um, now, the couple of uh, suggestions that we uh, give when using the animal eye tracking is that you want to make sure that you limit the focus area that the camera is um, using. Just like anything else that we've talked about earlier, you don't want to use animal eye tracking when you have the full um, uh, wide zone. I mean, yes, you could do that, but it may pick up other things that kind of look like eyes. I've run into that many times. Even with animals, for example, it may pick up an ear as opposed to an eye. So if you have your, your autofocus zone setting to be a large area, you know, it may find something else that looks like an eye and focus on that. So make sure that you um, uh, limit the area that it's going to focus on. But it's great because it makes sure that the eye is nice and, and sharp. And we're seeing basically all major manufacturers adding this feature. So it's definitely something to try out with your camera. Um, just don't expect it to be perfect because it's not perfect. We Our experience is that it works better with humans because Human eyes vary a lot less than animal eyes. And then there's some animals that works better than others, like pets, they work. It works really well with dogs and cats. Maybe not so much with, you know, for example, that puffin that we saw earlier. Exactly. So to continue some of these advanced autofocus settings, you know, every camera has their own host of settings within the menu. And there's so many of them. And as Juan said, there's some that you're going to want to use, others that you're just going to want to ignore because it's just going to be too much. But you can do things like control the tracking sensitivity, uh, control how fast the autofocus points may switch from one area to the next, uh, their reaction to sudden acceleration and deacceleration. You can set like a preferred focus zone when you're shooting horizontally. And then when you shoot in portrait or vertical mode, you can set a different preferred zone. Uh, you can change the balance between camera release, like when it starts firing off shots, versus when it actually acquires focus. And there's much more than that. The take-home message here, you should be familiar with some of these settings that your camera has available, and that will allow you to make these tweaks in the field. But better, like we talked about before, practice with your camera, go out, see how it's performing, and then make those tweaks during your practice sessions so that way you're not fuddling around with things in the field. Yeah, that, great, great, uh, great tips there. Now, one of the things that we do, will, uh, we will tweak sometimes is what we call the servo or the continuous focus response rates. And this is also called like tracking sensitivity or things like that. And the thing is, is if you have fast, erratic or multiple moving subjects, you, you'll probably want a more responsive servo or continuous autofocus setting. Slower, predictable or single subjects can use a slower or less responsive setting or what the camera manufacturers may call a more locked on setting. Now for fast action shooting, you should change your continuous autofocus priority to release. 
Like here's an example from a Sony menu where you can set the priority for the autofocus continuous mode to be release versus autofocus. Because in this case, if I'm shooting really fast action, I want to make sure I get all the shots in that fast burst. And I don't want the camera trying to decide in between those shots if it thinks it's in focus or not. Chances are it is going to be in focus. I just want to make sure I get all the shots so I capture that perfect moment of action. I don't want to be missing things because of autofocus delay. The other technique, too, is learn how to just feather that back button focus there. You know, if, if you're running into like a transition zone, like we talked about in a previous video, you don't want to be shooting when that animal's passing through that transition zone. You want to be able to feather that so that way you're not losing the tracking on your subject. Lots of great information there. But folks, one thing to keep in mind is not to get overwhelmed. There's lots of stuff that we talked about, lots of settings, you know, between tracking sensitivity, acceleration, deceleration, responsiveness. You know, don't go crazy about these settings. Um, you know, a lot of these cameras create a couple of different sets that you can choose from or preset settings that you can choose from. I would pick one of those, experiment with those, um, and go out and shoot. Don't try to tweak your camera when you're out in the field, you know, and risk getting those amazing shots. So don't obsess over it. Just understand your camera. Maybe practice when you're home with all those different settings or practice in a situation where it's not absolutely critical. Um, I see it over and over again where people on the field get a little obsessed about getting the right tweaks and the setting on the camera, and they miss those amazing shots. Okay. So here's a good question. When you're shooting in servo mode or continuous autofocus mode, is there any reason why you would not want to set the responsiveness to the highest setting? And the answer is, well, it depends. It depends what you're shooting. Um, obviously, if you're shooting a subject where you really do want those acute microfocus adjustments as it's running towards you or when it running away from you, yeah, you probably would do well having it set at the most responsive setting. But let's say you have a subject that you want to follow and you want to track no matter what. Even if something runs in front or you have a, a plant branch blow in front of it or something like that, in that case, you would want to have a less responsive setting. Here's an example. Let's say you're shooting your daughter's soccer game and she has the ball. You want to lock on to her as she kicks that game winning goal. So you've got it locked on, but then all of a sudden another player runs in front. If you have that camera set to a responsive, a highly responsive setting, then it's going to jump focus from her to that other player. If you have it set on a less responsive setting, then as that player runs in front, it's going to ignore that movement and it's going to keep the focus locked on to your primary subject. So there are times when you will want to use less responsive settings, other times where a highly responsive setting is going to be more appropriate. Well, why don't we look at a couple of examples here? Okay, so this particular example, this I showed, these are Asiatic um, elephants. I found these in Sri Lanka while I was leading a workshop there a number of years ago. And, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to capture with this image, or the, my primary subject of this image was this baby elephant underneath its, uh, its mother on the right-hand side. Um, and, you know, one of the things that was happening is this, uh, this sub-adult or this adolescent on the left-hand side, you know, kept getting in front of the baby and, and back up a little bit. The baby would move forward. Um, but like I said, I wanted to you know, focus on that baby that was underneath its mother. So by having too high of a responsive sitting in your camera, one of the things that can happen is as that adolescent kind of crosses over onto your main subject, onto that baby, the camera may actually switch and lock on onto the adolescent. And then any image that you make may not be critically focused on the, the baby elephant that I wanted to photograph. So this is a situation where having the lock on uh, or, or the bias of that uh, setting to more to lock on versus responsive can be more helpful because it will keep the camera more focused on the subject that I want focused on. Let's look at another example here on the next slide. Um, and this is a, uh, a baby grizzly bear with its, with its mama. Um, and as you can see, we are focused on this little bear in the foreground. But, you know, this mother on the right-hand side could at any point in time move its head and start looking towards us. If that were to happen, it is possible that the camera may see that movement 
Um, and it is possible that there's also more contrast on the face of that mother, and the camera will then jump the focus onto the mother. And as we talked about earlier, it's often best to have the focus on your front subject, not the rear subject. So by having a responsive setting to be more locked on or less responsive will give you a better result. As we were looking at this image, David also mentioned that, you know, if you look at the foliage in the foreground here, the, that may also confuse the camera if you have it in a more responsive setting. If the bears were to move or I were to move in that uh, foliage, that green leaf on the foreground there, got closer to the face of my um, cub, a bear cub, the camera may actually then lock on on that, on that uh, foliage, and then my bears would be completely out of focus. I would totally lose my responsiveness there, or my, my focus on the image there. So this is why finding the right setting between the responsiveness between having the most responsive autofocus system between more lock-on bias is important to try to make images or try to help your autofocus system kind of fo- you know, capture what you envision in your uh, in your mind. So folks, that's it for this latest episode of the Images in Focus show. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you feel like you learned something and that we earned it, we appreciate if you subscribe to our channel, ring that little bell to make sure that you get notified when we have new uh, episodes released, uh, as well as share it with your friends. If you know anybody who may enjoy these episodes and may learn something from them, we would appreciate it if you share it with all of them. We also have a Facebook group that you can join and you can post your questions, post your images, and we will also be notifying people there when we post new episodes. Until next time, take care, folks.